All right, friends, I am so excited for who you get to meet today. I'm sitting here with Sheila Gregoire, and I have been a gigantic fan of hers for a really long time. So Sheila, thanks so much for being on Girls' Night. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, Sheila, for women who haven't met you yet, can you tell us uh, who you are, what you do, and a fun fact about yourself? Yeah, so um, I am the blogger at lovehonorandvacuum.com. I write about marriage and sex all the time. So I have a couple of big books out, The Great Sex Rescue, where we interviewed 20,000 women, which was really fun. And then our new one, The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex. So I basically talk about like libido and orgasms and sex all the time. But when I'm not doing that, I'm knitting. I'm like a big knitter. I knit socks. I knit sweaters. I knit baby clothes. I knit from like the 1940s vintage, like like pattern books. Oh, I even have one here. Hold on. Hold on. For those oh my people, gosh. <laughs> here you go. This is this little sweater. Oh, it's so cute. I knit for my grandson. Oh my gosh. So cute. Yeah, it's from this 1940s pattern book. So there you go. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is precious. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's amazing. I, I love knowing cute. that about you. It is so cute. It is so cute. Um, I love that. Well, okay, before, you know, I have about a thousand questions for you, but I want to know, how did this get started? Like, how did you become, I know I've I've heard you call yourself a Christian sex lady before. Like, how did you be, how did you become this? Yeah, nobody grows up thinking I want to be the Christian sex lady. Like, that's just weird. And if you did want to be that, you that there'd be something wrong with you, right? Like, like it's, that, a, it's, it's a niche. It for sure is. Yes. Um, no, I actually started out mommy blogging in 2008. I had already had a couple of small books out. I was trying to get a bigger platform. So I started blogging because that's what everybody was doing back then. And I was talking about housework and organizing and parenting. But when I talked about sex, my traffic grew. And it seemed like that's what people wanted to know about. And my husband and I were also speaking at marriage conferences and we always got given the sex talk because nobody else wanted to do it. And we'll talk about anything. It doesn't bother us. So, you know, we sort of just got in that space. And before you knew it, that was most of what I was writing about and researching about. And um, yeah, and then every, To Love, Honor, and Vacuum just kind of delved into that. And now we've got the Bear Marriage Podcast and, and so much more too. Love that. I love it. Um, I came across um, the Good Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex right after I got married. I had a girlfriend uh, give it to me and she uh, brought it to me. We were, uh, she knew she was going to see me on Sunday Sunday at church. And so she uh, brought a copy. She like put it in a little bag so she didn't have to like, (laughs) I don't know, I didn't have to like carry it around. Um, But uh, she uh, gave it to me and she was like, this is just an incredible resource. And I'm so happy to have it. And I've passed it on to so many people. And then um, I came across The Great Sex Rescue a couple months ago. And uh, I listened to it on Audible. And I think it took me maybe two days. And I told my husband, like, you have to listen to this. And he did too. And um, it is just the most helpful thing I have heard anyone say about sex. And like reinforced so many things that I thought were true, but like nobody... You know, people aren't aren't talking about mm-hmm. some of these things, or the way that they do talk about them isn't this way. You know, it, it just it was so helpful, and so I can't stop talking about your work. Um, <laughs> we had you do a bonus video for uh, our marriage course that we recently started doing, um, but I just knew that I wanted to share you and your resources with our girls' night community because I, just, the work you're doing is just is honestly life changing. So um, I'm really grateful for you. Well, thank you. Um, so you, I know you've uh, you've been doing this for a really long time. You've talked to, I mean, you interviewed twenty thousand women for the Great Sex Rescue. Mm-hmm. I want to know what some of the common um, struggles are that you see couples having when it comes to their sex lives. Yeah, I I think it can be um, kind of summed up in two things. So either libido or obligation. Those and they're actually quite linked. <laughs> um, but you know the most common problem that people talk about is libido. And usually it's that he wants sex and she doesn't. And so the the it's presented as how can we boost her libido? How can we get her libido higher? And you know what? That is a valid question. I have a course about that. It's important to talk about it. But I think in many cases, we're missing the boat and that that's not the real problem. Um, it might be the, the most common thing you fight about, 
But libido is not a problem. Libido is a symptom. <laughs> like Interesting. Libido is caused by a whole bunch of other things. And it could be <laughs> that the reason she doesn't want sex is because sex has always made her feel used or it's never felt very good for her or it's almost entirely about him. And, you know, one thing that we found in our survey of 20,000 women is that we've got a 47-point orgasm gap, okay? Meaning that 95% of men report that they almost always or always reach orgasm in a given sexual encounter and the equivalent number for women is only 48 so we've got a huge orgasm gap. And like if I were to put a piece of chocolate cake in front of you, I would not have to convince you to eat it, probably, if you're a chocolate person like I am. Because mm -hmm. like chocolate is good, right? And sex is supposed to be good. And so why are we spending all of our time lecturing women on how great sex is and how they should want to do it instead of asking ourselves, why doesn't she like chocolate cake when chocolate cake's amazing? There must be something wrong with the chocolate cake. <laughs> so let's figure yeah. out what's wrong with the chocolate cake. Like, let's figure out what's going on with sex, that it isn't something yeah. that she wants. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, I, there, gosh, there's so many pieces of this. Um, I'm going to try to like be orderly about this, but now I have 47 <laughs> new questions. Well, so that's that's one thing to kick it off. Like there is this widespread rumor or truth, depending, you can tell us, that men want to have sex more than women do. Mm -hmm. And like, is that true? Well, are men taller than women? Uh, generally? Yes, but not always, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. and we get this when it comes to height, right? Like, like men are taller than women, but that doesn't mean that all men are taller than all women. You could easily have a man who is shorter than his wife. Like my, my great-grandfather was five foot six. My great-grandmother was five foot 11. And all the men in the family since have been over six feet. Because, <laughs> and it's not because of my great-grandfather, it's because of my great-grandmother, because she was tall. Yeah. And libido is, is kind of the same. So if you think about it as two overlapping bell curves, like yes, men often have a higher libido, but they don't always. So what we found in our survey is 50, in 58% of marriages, he has the higher sex drive. In 19%, she does. And in 23%, it's shared. So there's not really a big difference. However, <laughs> we also found that there's several key beliefs that are really common, especially in, among evangelicals, that artificially lower a woman's libido. So if she hadn't been taught this stuff, if she hadn't believed this stuff, she is more likely to have a shared or a higher libido. So what are those things? Well, things like, for instance, all men struggle with lust. It's every man's battle. We teach this like crazy. <laughs> and we found that being taught this as a teenager, even if you never believed it, lowers your libido when you grow up. Why? Because, well, I think there's several, there's several things. We, we talked in focus groups to women to try to figure this out. But one of the reasons is it presents sex as a threat. So if all men struggle with lust, it's every man's battle, then... A man can't look at you and respect you. So we can't have real intimacy. We can't experience a safe relationship with a man because he's always going to objectify me. So the objectification of women and male sexuality becomes seen as one and the same thing. And that makes men seem icky and it makes sex seem really icky. Because you feel like whenever I'm in public, all the men around me are undressing me with their mind. <laughs> And that's just always going to happen because that's the way men are. And that's just a really, really toxic message that is not based either in science or in scripture. And mm -hmm. yet we teach it a lot. Yeah. What is, what have you guys found is true? Because I mean, I, I didn't grow up really in the church at all, but I do remember being taught something like, like men think about sex every <laughs> 0.05 seconds or something, yes. which is like, yes. if your thought lasts for 0.0, like it's like, so you're thinking about it literally all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, What have you found in terms of that? Like, do men really have this like insane, insatiable sex drive? Is that Well, we know that some men probably do, right? Just in a bell curve, some men probably do, but a lot of men don't. And we know from the most recent brain brain meta anal like brain scan meta analysis, so these huge huge studies where they looked at all of the individual studies of MRIs between men and women's brains, is that there is not a significant difference at all. Almost all the difference between men and women's brains can be chalked up to just men have bigger brains than women because men are bigger than women. And when you look at a man with the, with a brain and a woman with a brain of the same size, there are no structural differences in the brain. So it isn't. <laughs> that men's brains are different. Even the idea that men are visual and women aren't, increasingly science is showing that's not true. What's actually happening, and this is this gets kind of technical, is women have more arousal non-concordance, okay? And what that means is that your body can be turned on without your mind being turned on or vice versa. So um, when women are exposed to visual stimulation, for instance, they could get lubricated. Like you can picture these college students getting paid money to be hooked up to these machines, <laughs> taking probes <laughs> in all the wrong places, right? <laughs> and, they're, and they're showing women pictures. And they're getting physical symptoms of arousal, even when their brain is saying, no, I don't like that. And with women, that's it's much more likely to happen than with men. So with men, when their body is, is aroused, it's more likely that their brain is also going to be saying, yeah, I'm aroused. But with women, it's not quite as straightforward. And women and men also tend to get aroused by different visual stimuli than each other. So it's not that women aren't visual. It's just that we interpret it differently. (laughs) So, and a lot of that is cultural. So, you know, increasingly, for instance, we're finding that younger women have, like, talk a ton about thirst traps, right? And they talk a ton about six-pack abs and all the stuff that I didn't even know what a six-pack ab was until I had teen girls, okay? Because I'm Gen X (laughs) and we didn't talk about this. Wait, like, okay, now I'm like, do I, I know what, like six, like a six-pack. Yeah, six-pack. Your abs. No, we didn't talk about this when I was a teen. Like, I didn't know. Okay, I got really nervous really quick. I was like, am I really old? And this is like some, you know, Gen Z thing that I just, I don't know what it is. Like, oh yeah, six pack. Yeah. You guys didn't talk about that? No, we didn't. Like we didn't. Um, um, and, and this is the thing. Like the way that we talk about how visual girls are today is totally different than when I was growing up. Um, mm-hmm. And so increasingly we're seeing that girls are visually stimulated because today they're allowed to be and they're encouraged to be. Now I'm not saying that's a good thing. Okay, I'm not saying that, girls should be objectifying men any more than men should be objectifying women. So I'm not saying, yay, girl power. That's not the point. (laughs) The point I'm just trying to make is that it's not a biological difference in the way that we often talk about it. So men, there's certainly different hormones. You know, there's certainly, um, if you look at bell curves, like I said, men do tend to have higher libidos, but it isn't as straightforward as we think. I I love hearing this because I think that when you are told all the time, you know, and I've, I've seen this, I've kind of become, um, so right after I got married, uh, my friend Hannah, who's been on the show a bunch of times, she's amazing. Um, we went out to lunch and she said, so how's sex going? And then she paused and she goes, you don't have to answer that question, but she goes, I just decided that I was going to be the friend who asks Mm -hmm. because nobody asks. And so if, if things aren't going well, like, who do you talk to? Mm -hmm. Um, And so she asked, and so I answered and we got to talk about it. And I love that. And that was just so inspiring to me. And so I feel like I've kind of become that friend also. That's like, how is this going? You don't have to talk about it, but you can. Um, And so because of that, I, you know, I've, I've talked to so many people about their sex lives and how, how it's going for them. Um, And I, I've heard from so many people that it's really surprising in marriage when, you're told all your life that your husband is going to just want to have sex with you 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And then he, you know, wants to sleep and eat. And sometimes he just isn't in the mood or, you know, he's just a person. Um, That is really, I think, surprising. And I I think that it's really easy to interpret things like that um, as a personal thing. It's like, you know, Mm -hmm. men always want to have sex, always, 100% of the time, no matter what. But my husband is like, yeah, occasionally trying to like eat and sleep and just be a person. Does that mean that he doesn't want me? Is that does that mean that there's something wrong with me? And and that's like 
a conversation that I feel like so many of us have had because we've been told that men are this way. And so when we don't see that reflected, it's really like, it causes problems. Yeah. Is, have you seen that? Absolutely. And I think um, among women in their 20s, it's even more so because we are seeing, again, that women in their 20s do tend to have a higher libido than women of other generations when they were in their 20s. Because I think mm-hmm. I think women have been given permission to today in a yeah. way that older generations weren't. And so it is very surprising. And I've talked to so many women who had to go to counseling. Like they had to go to marriage counseling to figure out they were just normal because they felt so rejected. And he felt like there must be something wrong with me because I only want sex twice a week. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's, I love that. I love that. So backing up a little bit, I know that for a lot of people, they've heard messages their entire lives that they are not supposed to be having sex. Um, And, you know, sometimes that message is given in a, you know, great way where it celebrates sex and talks about the fact that it is a really good thing. Um, But a lot of times sex is talked about like this dirty, bad thing that you should like you know, run away from with everything in you. And then all of a sudden you get to your wedding night and and it's like, flip a switch. All right, now you're allowed to. And, and I know for so many people, they have a really hard time flipping that switch. Can you like talk to us about that? How do we, if that's a message we've been given for so long, and then now we're having a hard time actually experiencing like freedom in our sex lives, how do we like, yeah, I guess. How do we how do we experience more freedom in our sex yeah, life? Yeah, you know what I think is happening is it's not just that we're not flipping the switch. It's that the way that we handle the honeymoon actually creates um, a negative dynamic towards sex that wrecks the um, the delight that we were having or the anticipation that we had. So if you think about it. Before you're married, you know you're you're enjoying kissing, right? And you're probably you, you could even be having some long makeout sessions, or you know you're getting breathless, and you're getting turned on. You're so looking forward to having sex, and then you get married, and you're in that hotel room or the apartment or wherever you are, and you get naked, and it's really awkward. And he kisses you for like a few minutes, and then you try intercourse, and it feels invasive and terrible and it it might even hurt a little bit it just feels really weird and you think was this really what i was looking forward to and it can actually really make us feel like sex is something dirty because of the way we do it on the honeymoon and this is something that we looked into a lot um, for the new edition of The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex and The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex to try to help people set up the honeymoon or if they're newly married and it didn't go so great to help them, you know, re- like redo fresh. that. Redo yeah. that. But I think what's happening is people aren't understanding the sexual response cycle. Okay, okay. So, so think about it this way. Before you're married, you're making out and you're getting turned on. Why are you getting turned on? Because you've been making out for a really long time and it's not going anywhere. Like because you can't go anywhere else, then you just spend that time like kissing and running your ha- your hands through each other's hair and along you know, each other's backs and you're being really affectionate and you've probably just watched a chick flick and you've been cuddling all night. And it's just, there's all of this excitement building. Um, and you you let yourself sit in that place because you're not going any further. And that's the way our bodies work, actually, is there's several distinct phases. So you ha- have excitement first, which is where, you know, you're getting warmed up, you're starting to think about sex, you're breathing a little bit heavier, you're feeling tingly. Then comes arousal, which is when you get really lubricated, you know, your genitals, you start to feel like you want to be touched in those areas, you know, in your breasts, whatever it might be. Then plateau when you're almost at orgasm and then orgasm. So you have to go through that in that order if you're going to reach orgasm. You need excitement and then arousal, plateau, orgasm. If you go right for the genitals before she's even really excited, let alone aroused, it's going to feel like a pap smear. Like it's just going to feel really awful. And I think what's happened is a lot of women have felt like they've been having pap smears on their honeymoon and then they wonder why they don't like sex. Because you don't touch the genitals until she's aroused. (laughs) You got to get her excited first and then into arousal. And if we can help people understand this, I think that we would do a lot better. See, the problem is for men, excitement and arousal look almost the same. 
There's very little difference. The penis gets a little bit thicker. The heart rate gets a little bit faster. But in general, there's not a lot of difference. For women, there's a big difference. And if you do things during the excitement phase or even pre-excitement that really should be done during arousal, it's not going to feel good for her. And so I have so many women telling me, I think my clitoris is broken. Or I think my vagina has no nerve endings or something. And it's not, that's not the problem. The problem is they skipped whole, um, whole stages and then she feels like she's broken. You know, in our, in our surveys, we asked both women and men, does he do enough foreplay? Okay. And in marriages where she frequently reaches orgasm, over 90%, both men and women say, yeah, he does enough. So that makes total sense. But when she doesn't frequently reach orgasm, 71% of guys still say they do enough foreplay. But so do 52% of women. And it's so like, just, people just don't know. Orgasm. So like enough for what, you know? But I think what's happening is they've read all the books like sheet music or intended for pleasure or whatever, which tell you how you're supposed to get her excited. And it's all about going for the clitoris. And he does this for a few minutes and nothing happens. And so she figures, well, I'm broken. So it's okay. Don't worry about me. Just go ahead. I feel like... So, like, there's so much to that. The, the idea that you're broken, like that, I feel like so many people have felt that. You know, there's something, there's something wrong with me. And then also the like, don't worry about me, just, just go ahead kind of thing. You know, one of the things that you talk, have talked a lot about that, you know, I've, I've gotten to hear you talk about is just the need for, for patience. Mm-hmm. Like on both people's sides, it's there is nothing less sexy than feeling like you're rushed or mm-hmm. feeling like you're a burden. Um, and so I feel like it's really important for both your person and you to to not treat you like a burden and not treat your like your pleasure or your part of the of the dynamic, I guess, as like an extra. It's a it's vital. It is, but you know what's interesting is that it's not mentioned very much in Christian literature. Like in the book, Love and Respect, which was the first book that I read that really got me started in this whole direction, because I used to just write about sex. And now what I do is I more critique a lot of the really bad teachings and show how we went off base, right? And that's really what The Great Sex Rescue is about, was I surveyed 20,000 women to try to find if there's certain teachings which affected their marital and sexual satisfaction. And I, it all started when I read the sex chapter in Love and Respect because he wrote this entire chapter on sex and he never once mentioned that women can or should feel pleasure too. Not once. The sex chapter just simply said that men need physical release. And so you should minister to him sexually as unto Jesus Christ. And if you don't, he's really um, tempted to have an affair. Yeah, that's not sexy either. No, <laughs> no, it's really not. Obligation is not sexy. And yet, uh, and, and actually the obligation, what we call the obligation sex message. So that idea that women are, are obligated to give men sex when they want it was the most damaging message that we measured. It was largely the reason that evangelical women have twice the rate of a sexual pain disorder called vaginismus as the general population. So we measured 22.6% of women experience sexual pain. That's very high compared to the general population. And it's heavily linked to obligation sex. And in fact, a woman's chance of experiencing vaginismus or sexual pain increases when she believes the obligation sex message to the same extent as if she had been abused. So it's like our bodies interpret obligation sex as trauma. Wow. Yeah. This Talk is- to us about, for people who don't, like, don't know exactly what the obligation sex message is, or like, have I been taught that? What, like, t- what, is, the, what is the obligation sex message? It really is this idea that he needs sex in a way that you will never understand, and that He can't be expected to be faithful to you unless you give him sex frequently. And unless you give him sex frequently, he isn't going to feel loved and he isn't going to feel engaged in the marriage and he won't be able to really connect with you because this is his most basic need. And it's often taught in church, like, do not deprive, you know, do not deprive each other using those verses, which is a misuse of those verses because 
if she ain't orgasming and if she feels pressure, then she's already being deprived because sex is supposed to be mutual and intimate and pleasurable for both. And as soon as you say that she doesn't matter, then it's no longer intimate. So those verses don't even apply. (laughs) What those verses are saying is that a healthy sex life, which is mutual, intimate, and pleasurable for both, is supposed to be a good part of marriage. And Paul was arguing there against celibacy. He wasn't saying that you're entitled to sex anytime you want it, or you're entitled to intercourse anytime you want it. So it is a misuse of those verses. But as soon as we give this obligation message, we really create this situation where sex is no longer about intimacy, where it's a culmination of just the commitment and the passion that you feel for one another. Now, sex becomes simply something that she gives and he's entitled to. So it's a male Mm -hmm. entitlement and a female obligation. And when they both believe that, her orgasm rate plummets, her libido plummets, her sexual pain rates rise, um, her marital satisfaction plummets. It's just a very toxic mess. Yeah. Talk to us about vaginismus because I I had never heard of it before reading your book, which is the problem. Uh, And I I know that a lot, a lot, I mean, you said 26%, right? 22.6, yeah. 22.6% of of women in the church, I guess, um, Mm -hmm. experience it. So what is vaginismus? Like, how does it start? How does it happen? Yeah, so um, it's a multifaceted a sexual dysfunction disorder where the muscles in the vaginal wall contract or become super tight, which can make intercourse either really painful if not impossible. And 7% of women reported it actually being impossible. Um, Pelvic floor physiotherapists can really help with this. And I highly recommend seeing a pelvic floor physiotherapist if you're going through this. Reading The Great Sex Rescue can also really help because a big part, like what we found and we've presented at the American Physiotherapy Convention actually about this, Uh is that women's beliefs about sex are highly tied to vaginismus. And so when we can challenge some of these toxic beliefs and tell her, no, you don't need to believe in obligation sex, you know, we can restore her agency. We can restore the idea that sex is intimate. (laughs) Then that can really help with healing as well. Um, And a number of things can contribute to it. It's it's how we hold our pelvic floor. Um, Gymnasts and dancers are more susceptible to vaginismus because they've often kept those muscles clenched their entire lives. Um, Certain sports injuries can aggravate it. Like there's different um, certain... uh, um, digestive issues can aggravate it. Like it is a multifaceted thing. And, and so it can be complicated to treat. Um, but pelvic floor physiotherapy is, is the way to go for that. And it's interesting that so many people have never heard of vaginismus, but almost everyone knows what, what erectile dysfunction is. Like we all know that one, right? And vaginismus is way more common among people under the age of 40. Way more common. And yet it gets almost no research dollars. And it's actually more um, like erectile dysfunction means you can't have sex. Okay, vaginismus also means you can't have sex, but it, it it also causes her deep pain. So like this is really, erectile dysfunction does not cause pain, but vaginismus does. And yet we're not really researching it or putting, yeah, putting the priority there. I know that you've talked about like kind of a, sort of like a vicious cycle of like, if you try intercourse before, um, before you're fully aroused, then it's more painful. And then the next time you're, kind of scared. So you're clenching more and then it's like more painful. Is that a cycle of vaginismus or does that cause vaginismus or is it just more like painful intercourse? It can be. Um, What we also found in that that, like bad first sex can increase the chances of, of, of having vaginismus. So we found that among couples who only ever had sex with each other and when we controlled for abuse, so that wasn't a factor, If you waited until after the wedding, you were 25% more likely to experience vaginismus than if you had sex before the wedding. Now, I am not saying that people should have sex before the wedding, (laughs) but what I am saying is that's a very clear sign that the way we're doing the honeymoon is wrong because we're rushing things and then things are uncomfortable. She feels bewildered. You push through because you're supposed to, and this can create a vicious cycle um, which again, pelvic floor physiotherapists can help you get over this. But also, you know, if there's pain, just stop. Like, just stop. Sex is not supposed to hurt. <laughs> and, and you know, if it does hurt, you know, the first time, like the hymen breaking is not a super painful thing. 
Um, many women already have a hymen that's broken. Um, some women do have like a perforated hymen or, or where there's only small holes and they actually need it surgically open. That's really rare. <laughs> so I don't want to cause everyone to, to fret about that. Um, but on the whole, yeah, like sex is not supposed to hurt a lot. And so if it does, it's way better to just stop what you're doing and have fun figuring out each other's bodies in another way and then come back to this in a day or two. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that you, I've heard you talk about like the fact that you don't actually need to have sex on your wedding mm-hmm. night, like, or you don't need to have intercourse right. on your wedding night. Um, and and I totally, like when you're talking about, you know, you get to the hotel room and, and how different that scenario is than just um, a no pressure post uh, chick flick make out, you know, it's like, there's, there's no pressure on that. Your, hunt, your wedding night, you've thought about for a really long time. Um, and there's so much, there's so much like writing on that night. And, and there's not really a lot of time to like relax. Like it's, a, it's been a really stressful day. It's been a really stressful mm-hmm. year, you know? And, mm-hmm. and then it's all leading up to this moment. So it just is kind of setting you up for, it just makes sense that a lot of people kind of go into that like pretty clenched, like, even like your fists, I feel like are clenched. You yes. know, you're just you're. There's a lot of pressure, and so I really like the idea that you don't have to, you don't actually have to have intercourse that first night. Like, try to slow down. Yeah, try something else. Like, start at the beginning. Something that we, we talked a lot about before we got married was one our expectations, which I'm really grateful for because I think I thought that. Carl had certain expectations for our wedding night and our honeymoon and stuff because I was told that that's what all men are expecting, mm-hmm. you know? And the more we talked about it, the more he was like, he, I think he said something like, Seth, this is preseason. This is not the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, I really appreciate that. Like, we have we have time. We have a lot of time um, to figure this out. And so you don't need to like go from zero to 60 right away. Yeah. And I think that that takes some of the pressure off. Yeah, what we recommend in in both the Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex and the Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex is is a three-point plan, okay? So you need to do it in this order. First of all, just work on feeling comfortable because it's weird to be naked in front of someone, (laughs) right? So just work on feeling comfortable. Have a bath together, have a shower together, you know, touch stuff, whatever. (laughs) Then work on on getting her aroused. So make sure you get her like so that she actually is lubricated so she's like really enjoying things. Um, Even bring her to orgasm in another way. Okay, but work on, on, figure out how her body works. Figure out what she likes. Um, And then after that, you can work on intercourse. And for some people, all of that can be done in the first night. And for some people, it's going to take a couple of days or even a couple of weeks. And it doesn't matter how long it takes in that initial time. Um, I mean... If you're really feeling uncomfortable, like in three months, then you should probably see a counselor or something. But like, (laughs) you know, but in general, like, you know, if it takes, if it takes a couple days, if it takes like two weeks, it's not a big deal. But if you rush it when it's painful, when she's not aroused at all, and then you continue, then you think this is what intercourse is. Mm -hmm. And you keep doing that over and over again. It's really hard at the 10 year mark to go back to the beginning. And so just give yourself grace at that beginning part and start out well. <laughs> yeah, I like that. What do you, you know, as we've been talking about, the, I think there are some misconceptions about like what sex should be like for women. Um, like it seems like a lot of men aren't totally sure, but then a lot of women aren't really sure either. Um, mm-hmm. And so if a woman is realizing that like she's eating some chocolate cake that's like not great, like not great, you know, and and it's it's either hurting or just not feeling good. Um, mm-hmm. How do we go about fixing that? Like, how do you, how do you have that conversation without well, we, just crushing the soul of your partner? Yeah, we need to remember that 95%, okay? He is going to orgasm 95% of the time. He is not the focus because no matter what you do, he's going to have a good time. <laughs> so she <laughs> needs to be the focus. And the problem is that we tend to take his experience of sex as the standard. So because he enjoys intercourse, because he can orgasm easily through intercourse, then the goal is to get her to catch up. So we need to make sure that she enjoys the same thing. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit crass, all right? But I want everyone to picture the hand movements that you would use to manually stimulate a man or that he would use to masturbate 
versus the hand movements that you would use to manually stimulate a woman or to have her masturbate, okay? Which one of those looks more like intercourse? Yeah, (laughs) the male one. Right? (laughs) Like (laughs) the way that we normally would stimulate her doesn't look a lot like intercourse. And that should tell us something about how her body was made. You know, the clitoris was not put up the vagina, all right? It, it does not get maximum stimulation through intercourse. That doesn't mean it can't feel good during intercourse. You actually can. And the clitoral roots go up the front wall of the vagina. And, you know, by, um, by, by moving muscles in the right way, by clenching muscles in the right way, by getting the right angle, you can actually really enjoy intercourse. But most women are going to need a lot of foreplay first. And that doesn't mean like that they're somehow less sexual than he is. Like, oh, he's ready to go, but she's a problem. And so we have to take care of her. No, that's the way her body was made because she needs to get comfortable with this. And, and that's, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> you know, that can actually be quite a good thing. And that's the way our bodies were actually designed. What percentage of women like consistently orgasm just from intercourse. Do you know? Yeah, it's pretty low. Like it's, it's a, what we found, I think it was 40% could orgasm through intercourse of women who can orgasm. So not of all women. Okay. So that means that most women who orgasm don't orgasm that way. Okay. They need a lot. They need something else. <laughs> so, okay. so we need we need to stop this idea that his his way is the standard. And the other thing is that women have no refractory period, by which I mean after women orgasm, they can either keep orgasming or they can keep feeling good with sexual content contact. Whereas with a man, after he orgasms, he's kind of done for like forty five minutes. And not just that, as soon as he orgasms, everything in his body is saying to him really, really loudly, you want to go to sleep, (laughs) okay? (laughs) So if you're thinking, well, we'll just have intercourse and then if she doesn't orgasm, he'll take care of her afterwards, that doesn't tend to work because even if he wants to, you can tell he's not really into it and then she's feeling like a bother and she's saying, no, it's okay. And so the way that our bodies are made, because she doesn't have a refractory period, we're actually made for her to go first. (laughs) So she goes first and then you figure him out because again, he's the 95% one. So she's the one that needs to be the priority. What, so how do you like you know, we're sitting here listening to this. What do you do if if you're, you haven't been really enjoying sex and you're like, how do you talk to your partner about that without hurting his feelings? Mm-hmm. I, this is what I want y'all to understand, okay? You matter. Like you seriously matter. Do you think it's better to spend 20 years not enjoying sex so that he might be able to feel like he's not a bad lover? Like, no, you matter. And you need to have these conversations with him. And it doesn't have to be you're doing this wrong. It can just simply be, you know, I feel like sex was meant to be this amazing, passionate thing for us. And it's not that. Like, we're missing out on something. So can we do a big research project. Can we go back to the beginning and just figure out how my body works? Because I want to really enjoy this with you, you know, but I feel like we're missing out on something big. Yeah. I like that. I like that. You don't have to say, hey, you're bad at this. Because that's mm-hmm. not the case. Mm-hmm. Like it's a, it's, it is a group project and it's something that you need to figure out together. And, and so, um, you know, giving feedback Mm-hmm. is a really important thing. People can't read our minds. Yep. But yeah, it, it doesn't have to be a, you're, you're bad at this. It's, hey, let's, like, let's figure this out together. Right. And the other thing to remember is if he is honestly not interested in making you feel good, if he honestly mm-hmm. thinks that intercourse is all that matters and he should get to just have intercourse no matter what it does for you, it's all right for you to say, I love you. I want to make love to you. I want to have an amazing sex life with you, but I'm no longer willing to be used. 
Mm-hmm. And so until we're going to make this into a mutual thing, I'm going to say no. That's totally okay because sex was meant for you too. You're not refusing sex. You're just refusing to be used. And in the long run, when women allow themselves to be used, that ends up really bad. Women can only do that. What we found is women can only do that for like a couple of decades and then the marriage just gets sexless anyway. Mm. Oof. Man, that's a really hard, this is hard. While we're, while we're kind of on the subject of hard things, um, I, something you talked a lot about in uh, The Great Sex, sex Rescue is um, if your spouse struggles with porn, Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of the obligation sex message, I think that there is also sort of this idea that like, if your person struggles with porn, if you could just like step it up, then they wouldn't. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, like there's a new book, um, relatively new book, it's just a couple months old now, Married Sex, and it came out after The Great Sex Rescue. And Gary had actually read The Great Sex Rescue, which made me really surprised that he put this in. But he was praising a woman for sending nude photos to her husband because he said now neurologically her husband would be drawn to her body instead of other people's bodies. So sending nude photos is a way to help them resist pornography, which is such a load of... (laughs) I can't even say it. Like, Like It's not scientifically sound. It's not morally sound. Like you can't defeat porn by becoming porn because the, the, it's the root of the problem with porn is objectification. It's saying, I get to use someone else for my gratification. I get to see them as only body parts. Whereas healthy sex is not about using someone for your gratification. It's about truly knowing someone. Sex and porn are polar opposites. They are not substitutes for one another. Hmm. And you can't have so much sex that he won't watch porn because porn is him wanting to use and objectify someone else. And in a relationship, that's much harder to do. And so even if you're having sex with him, if he really wants to objectify and use someone, he's going to go do that. And the, so we need to stop this idea that is, it's everywhere. It's in so many resources, like Sheet Music by Kevin Lehman told women that it's a good idea to give him a hand job or oral sex during your period because five days is a really long time to go without watching porn. Like he could get tempted because your period is a difficult time for your husband. Just everyone just sit on that for a minute. <laughs> He said that your period is a difficult time for your husband. Okay. Um, it's a difficult time for somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know if it, I don't know that it really impacts him that much. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, but this is really common. Every Man's Battle talks about how, you know, when he quits lust and porn, women can be like merciful vials of methadone for them. So you are his methadone, which is so dehumanizing. It's like mm-hmm. what he really wants is that, but he will, sat- he, he will settle for you because you can drug him enough and satiate him enough that he won't go for what he really wants. It's, it's really, really scary. So this message that his porn use is your fault is simply not true. You cannot be sexy enough to stop him from watching porn. You cannot have sex enough to stop him from watching porn. That is something he needs to decide to do on his own. You can, however, set boundaries and you can say, this is not something that I'm going to tolerate in this marriage. This is not something I'm okay with. Yeah. What do you, you know, if if there's a couple who is like right in the thick of it um, with this, like what are, what are some resources or like, is it, is it talking to a licensed counselor? Is that kind of the, like a really good first step in the direction of kind of overcoming this like addiction really? Yeah, it just, it depends. You know, um, not all porn use is the same. Some guys honestly want to stop and they're able to stop. Most guys will need help, (laughs) like an accountability Mm -hmm. group, a licensed counselor or whatever. Um, Michael, there's a lot of books that are really good. Jay Stringer's um, Unwanted is really good. Michael John Cusick's Surfing for God uh, Andrew Bowman stuff. There's a lot of books that are really good that are totally different from Every Man's Battle. So it's it's about understanding where the essential wounds came from that caused, you know, the porn habit. It's understanding what vulnerability looks like and allowing yourself to be vulnerable with your wife again. 
um, not trying to cover things up with porn, not trying to cover up some of your emotional pain with porn. All of that stuff does need to be looked at. So those books are really good. And I think, yeah, seeing a counselor can help both of you together. But you know, what we found is that about 50% of married evangelical men use porn in some way. Most of them it's rarely, so it's not like it's daily or weekly or anything like that. But we're still looking at 50% of guys. And 83% of men under the age of 30 have used it at some point in their lives. The good news is when you quit porn, if it honestly is behind you and you don't have this entitled mindset towards sex, your sex life and your marriage can be just about as good as if he'd never used it. So mm-hmm. it is something that people can recover from when he takes that step. Yeah. This is like kind of a departure, but I want to make sure to talk about it. You know, you mentioned kind of at the beginning that uh, differences in libido is like potentially the thing that you fight about the most. And I know that you you talked about something Uh, called the spontaneous versus the responsive Mm -hmm. libido. And this is something I'd never heard before that I was like fascinating to me. Um, So I want to hear about that and really want to just talk for a minute about what we do if like you would be happy with four times a week and he would be happy with two or vice versa or you know whatever that looks like. So yeah, talk to us about the the different kinds of libidos first. Yeah, so some people want sex first. Like they're just totally in the mood And then you start. (laughs) And some people, they actually couldn't care less until they start kissing. So you think about any movie that you watch, any TV show, anything, the plot with sex always looks the same, right? So they're panting and then they start to kiss and then the clothes come off and they end up in bed. And no matter what you watch, that's what happens, right? Like they're gonna pant and then kiss and close in bed. So that's what we think it goes like, pant, kiss, close bed. So then you're at home and you're waiting to pant. And you think, I guess I just don't want sex. And what I want people to understand is some people are pant, kiss, close, bed. But some people are more like bed, kiss, close, pant. (laughs) You know? Some people are like, I'm not actually panting. I'm not actually thinking about it. I'm not actually in the mood until we start kissing. And then I'm like, oh, you know what? This could actually be fun. And you jump in. (laughs) And... So some people have what we call a spontaneous libido and some people have more of a responsive libido or desire where they're more responding to someone else. But when they decide, hey, this is actually going to be good for me, I am going to jump in and they jump in with, you know, the right frame of mind, their body totally responds. And we, we measured this with women. We asked if women were generally aroused or thinking about sex before they started or if they started having sex, but they were, but they were confident they were going to get aroused. And whether they were aroused at the beginning or not, as long as they were confident they were going to get aroused and they reached orgasm, then afterwards they felt the same blissful feelings. So Mm -hmm. whether you're spontaneous or responsive doesn't actually matter. It's whether you're confident you're going to get there. Yeah, okay. And being responsive does not mean you're less sexual. You're just as capable of reaching orgasm. You're just, you know, all of those things are... Totally fine. It's just that you may need a little bit more warming up. And men, while most men are spontaneous and most women are responsive, there can be the opposite. <laughs> and yeah. what I would say to the person who's more responsive is just understand that that your desire and your physical response is largely in your head. So you can decide, you know what? I'm not totally in the mood right now. I'm a little bit tired, but I know I'm going to sleep better if I have sex. I really Mm -hmm. love my husband or my wife who's ever listening and I want to have a great time. And so I'm going to do this tonight. And you just decide, yeah, I'm going to do this. You jump in and you you start paying attention to your body. You think about your body. You think good thoughts. You don't let your mind wander and sex will generally work well. And so to the responsive person, I would just say that if you're a more spontaneous person and you're married to someone who's more responsive, just realize that's not a rejection. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't mean they don't want you but you do need to give them something to respond to. (laughs) Yeah. So it's sort of like the the inciting incident is is different. Like for a spontaneous person, it could be the wind blows or something, you know, and they're like, ooh, this sounds good. Uh, The responsive person may be thinking about something like their to-do list when the wind is blowing. Right. But if their person comes and starts kissing them, then they're going to go, oh, yeah, okay, like Mm -hmm. I could be into this. But the fact that they were thinking about their to-do list instead of 
being inspired by the wind doesn't right. mean that they're less sexual. It just means that the thing that like, you know, starts the starts the ball in motion is just different for them. Yes, exactly. Yep. I, I really, I love that. So when you are like in, in your marriage, as you're trying to kind of figure out what this looks like for you guys, if you do discover that one person's libido is higher than the other, how do you find a middle ground without people feeling rejected or deprived or pressured? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that and that is hard. And you know, people are always going to have to navigate this. What we did find is that when women frequently reach orgasm, I'm going to list five things for you, okay? So everyone listens, five things coming up. When women frequently reach orgasm, when there's high marital satisfaction, when they feel emotionally close during sex, so they don't feel used, you know, they don't feel like he's just thinking about porn, they are emotionally close. When there's no sexual dysfunction and when there's no porn use, frequency tends to take care of itself. So it tends to settle out, you know, at least once a week, if not more. <laughs> so, so it tends to not be a huge problem. So if there's someone who seriously never wants sex, then that's worth exploring as to why. And it could be that you're just in a relationship where you've got really small kids and you're exhausted all the time. And maybe your spouse needs to step up to the plate. Like if one of you has a lot more downtime than the other, that is an issue that needs to be addressed. Hmm. If one of you has a lot more ability to just sit down and do nothing (laughs) and is getting significantly more sleep than the other, that does need to be addressed. And that could just simply be the thing that's killing your libido. Is that one of you is just exhausted? Yeah, you know, yeah. and and even that out, and that's often that 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 often takes care of itself. The other thing is like there's there's been a lot of research into this, but the once a week number is kind of a magic number. So if you don't have sex, or if you have sex less than once a week, that's going to significantly hurt your marital satisfaction and everything for most people. Having sex more than once a week does help, but it's like there's a law of diminishing returns. It's like it's like a drastic <laughs> increase to get to once a week. And then it's just kind of like a little bit after that. So I kind of talk about once, you know, beyond once a week, it's a preference. And if it's a preference, you guys just need to work it out. If someone like wants sex less than once a week, it's a problem. And we need to figure this out for most couples. Now, if you both want sex less than once a month, once a week, Okay, <laughs> you know, and you're happy. That's the, I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't be happy, but but I think we need to differentiate between preference and problem. And when there is a preference, work on your marriage. Like seriously, just have fun together, do hobbies together, laugh a lot. Because when you have that goodwill, then the lower, more responsive libido person is going to want to give more anyway, <laughs> and the higher libido person isn't going to feel as put out. You know, yeah. And so, when it's a preference issue, work on your marriage <laughs> and have a lot of fun together. And it, these things will be easier to talk about. When it's a problem issue, you've really got to figure out what the what the what the issue is. That's awesome. That's awesome, um, Sheila. I'm I'm so grateful for your work. Really, it's this is really important. And there there haven't been very many helpful resources <laughs> out there until you made them. And so I'm going to link to all of your books and all your resources on our show notes because I want women to come uh, to to know that you are there for them as a resource. But thank you for coming on Girls' Night and, and thanks for, for being this person for us. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. 